Brother Aaron's topic for this afternoon is going to be perf perfect, perfect, perfect that which is lacking in your faith. From 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 10. I wanted to speak and consider just a few minutes about perfection. The Lord in the Old Covenant, in the Old Scriptures, affirmed that he required perfection. He affirmed that he required it from his people. He spoke to Abraham in Genesis 17, verse 1, he said, Walk before me and be thou perfect. No qualifiers. You be perfect. He also told his people, Israel, to be perfect. Deuteronomy 18, verse 13, chapter 18, verse 13, Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. This was a requirement for God's people. He also commanded perfection in all of their offerings. You remember all of the offerings that were, that were prescribed under the Old Covenant? In Leviticus 22, verse 21, the Lord said, It shall be perfect to be accepted. So if it wasn't perfect, it wouldn't be accepted by the Lord. Perfection, something that's required by God. Now, Jesus himself called for perfection from his followers. He said, Be ye perfect, as also your Father in heaven is perfect. So here he gave a reason for this perfection. Now, backing up in the old scriptures again, the Lord did affirm his own perfection as well. He called for perfection from his people, but that's because he was a perfect, he is a perfect God himself. Amen. There was recently a quote that I saw making its way around that said, you don't have to be perfect, Jesus is. Well, to some people it might sound, Brother Tony, I'm with you, it might sound honorable to some people, but I don't agree with that. That is not the case. We do have to be perfect. God commands perfection. But the good news is Jesus is perfect so that we can be perfect in him as well. So we see that the Lord has, first of all, made the commandment to be perfect, but he's also made the way to be perfect. The psalmist said, he will perfect that which concerneth me. It is the Lord working in us to make us perfect. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, it says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. So God is the one that's going to do this in us. We come together with him. We strive to be perfect. We walk before him in a perfect manner with a perfect heart. And he will make us perfect. He's going to make us acceptable to himself. Now, Paul knew that this was the truth, and he ministered yeah. with this in view. <clears throat> He's, he was also said in other scriptures that this is what we wish, even your perfection. Yeah. As a minister of Christ, as an ambassador for the Lord, this was his desire, was for the perfection of the people. He also told the Colossians that he preached Christ, warning and teaching every man in all wisdom, in order that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So this was the thrust of his ministry, was perfecting the saints. Yeah. Now remember why the Lord gave the gifts to the body. Brother Aaron, I know, has read this, and several of the brethren this weekend have read this passage, but the gifts given to the body, which were the apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, says that these were given for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we see that this is the reason the Lord gave these gifts. This is part of his working perfection in the midst of the body of Christ. Amen. Now Paul's desire was to perfect that which was lacking in the Thessalonians' faith. So we see here that each member of the body, particularly the ministers, they have a hand in bringing this perfection to the other members of the body. We eat, what each one receives from the head is intended, is given in order to bring perfection to the whole. We've said this before, it's meant to be sharing. So withholding what you've been given from the head does hinder the perfection of the whole. If my faith is lacking, then you could be at a disadvantage. But likewise, if your faith is being made perfect, then I am going to be benefited as well. Now Paul wanted to perfect that which was lacking in their faith. Faith. Consider this just for a minute. We are pleasing to the Lord by faith. It's impossible to please him without faith. And faith is the victory 
that overcomes the world. We are being kept by the power of God through faith, and we are being saved by grace through faith. So it's important that we be perfect in our faith, that we be perfected in our faith. So to perfect something is to complete it, bring it to a completion. And we have this exhortation in scripture, you add to your faith. So we see here, this is an a progress of bringing perfection. You add to your faith virtue and knowledge and temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness and charity. You add to your faith or increase it, or we could say perfect your faith. But here is the end of being perfected in faith. This is the next verse from what I read a few minutes ago for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry the end of being perfected in faith, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And here is what Paul's desire was for the Thessalonian brethren. So before I sit down, I'll read Brother Aaron's text. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 10. Night and day, praying exceedingly, that we may see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. This letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians is, has somewhat of a tender note to it. The, the Thessalonians were new believers and reminds me of the, the words of the prophets. Uh, said he will uh, gently lead them that are with young. And Paul, uh, he, he wrote to, uh, to the churches, he wrote to individuals, and he wrote appropriately. He spoke accordingly uh, to what was, what was needful what, at, at the time. <clears throat> so these brethren were, were young in the faith, and Paul uh, saw something that needed to be added to their faith, not because of any wrongdoing necessarily, but because they were young. They were, they were new. And he did not say that he was going to increase their faith. Maybe a technical distinction here. But it needs to be said that he was going to perfect what was lacking in their faith. He didn't say, I'm going to increase your faith. Paul also said that uh, I watered, or Paul, uh, I planted, Apollos watered, and God giveth the increase. He did not say, I'm going to perfect what's wrong with your faith. He's going to perfect what was lacking. In their faith, because the faith they had, there, there, there wasn't some uh, uh, something intricately wrong with it. Jesus doesn't give flawed faith, but he does give a faith that has to be perfected or matured. And he also was not going to have dominion over their faith. He was going to perfect that which was lacking in their faith. Now, I'm going. The first point I want to make is about judging and discerning. Because if someone is going to engage in an effort to perfect what's lacking in my faith, then I want them to be judging and discerning. They, Paul, knowing the faith, he was also able to know their faith. And it does have to be in that order. Paul, Paul knew the kind of faith that Jesus gives, and he knew the kind of faith that Abraham had. He knew the faith that God had given to him. He, Paul knew the faith. And so then he was able to appropriately address the faith that the Thessalonians had. He, he could see, because he knew the faith, he could see the condition of, of their faith. He, was, he had judged, Paul had judged, and he found a need. He had discerned that there was a need that, needed, that, could be, that he could fill, perfect what was lacking in their faith. He could see some low places that needed to be brought up, and he could see some high places that needed to be brought down. He could see more of these brethren than these brethren could see of themselves. Because Paul was discerning. He was able to judge. He was able to evaluate. He told, he regularly told people and churches something about themselves that they themselves did not know. Because Paul was discerning. And that's what he was saying to the Thessalonians here. Paul could see dangers that brethren faced before they saw the dangers that they themselves were facing. He could also see gifts in brethren before the brethren saw the gift in themselves. I think he's, he identified the gifts and the abilities that Timothy had before anyone else did. And he exhorted Timothy in ways that may have even been surprising to Timothy. 
But Paul was able to see it because he was judging and discerning. See, he that's spiritual judgeth all things. And that's what Paul's doing. Now, Timothy naturally cared for the state of the brethren. That's why, that's why Paul had such, such trust in Timothy. As he, he had judged Timothy faithful and that he, he, because he naturally cared for the state of the brethren. It means that Timothy was also discerning and observant about the condition of the saints. Now, who cares if Timothy cares for me if Timothy knows nothing about my condition? What does that care mean if Timothy is not able to properly assess what I may need or what I may be deficient in, what I may be lacking? Who cares if he cares if he doesn't know what the condition is? But the, see, Timothy, he did know. <clears throat> like, see, Barnabas at Antioch, he, went, he saw the grace of God. How do you see the grace of God? Yeah. You've got to judge and discern. There's, there's always evidence of grace. Gra because grace does something. Where God, where God gives grace, grace does something. It manifests itself some way. And Barnabas was able to see it. So was Timothy. He was, they were able to judge and discern. This is a, he'd seen the grace of God. Well, here's an example of seeing the grace of God is seeing people believe the gospel. Where you see people believe, you're seeing grace. That's what great, we believe through grace, right? So believing is the, is the result of, of grace. <clears throat> care for the saints will always be attended by discernment. Otherwise, the care means very little. Those whom the Lord equips to perfect the saints will also be those whom he equips to care for the saints. Let me say that again. He, who, he whom the Lord equips to perfect the saints are also those whom he equips to care for the saints. They, it's like they're two companions that travel together. Paul cared for the saints, and he was also able to, to perfect the saints. Amen. We want these things to always be found together. Jude wrote his letter because he was concerned and he was alarmed by the things that he saw in the brethren. There, there came a time in our text in Thessalonica that Paul could no longer forbear because of his concern for the people, for the brethren. John wrote his uh, first epistle to the brethren to this end, that they sin not because he loved the brethren. It was his care that drove him it mo moved and motivated him to write the things that he did to help the brethren. We always, we always want discernment to attend the care, and it, all, and it does in the kingdom of God. Peter wrote his letter so that he could minister to the brethren after he died. He said, so that you will always have these things in, in remembrance after my decease. I thought, well, that's ingenious. Mm -hmm. Peter cared so much for the brethren, he wrote it down for them so they could read it again after he died. It's because of his care, because he loved the brethren. He labored, he labored for them. Paul wrote many of his letters because someone was out uh, to devour the saints. Paul was actually going to battle for the brethren because of his care. He discerned a need, and then he engaged to supply and minister what was needed because Paul was judging and discerning the condition of the saints. The man of God is always concerned for the, well, for the brethren's well-being. When Paul said, I could no longer forbear, Paul wasn't, it, it wasn't a personal um, uh, concern that I, I, I sure hope those people in Thessalonica are doing what I told them to do. It, it wasn't that, like a personal drive. It was a, it was a godly drive. In fact, in one place, Paul said a, that he longed after them in the bowels of Jesus Christ. That means when Jesus was moved towards a certain people, or person, Paul was too. He, he, just, he loved and cared for the brethren in the bowels of Jesus Christ. It was not, a, it was not personally motivated. It was kingdom motivated. Amen. The care of all the churches came upon him daily. This is the kind of man that you want to engage in perfecting the brethren. Someone who has the care of all the churches coming on him daily. The Lord does not send hirelings to his sheep that do not have care for his sheep. In fact, he said in the prophets, I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and with understanding. Those who have no care for the flock are those whose mouths must be stopped. Now, on this, 
this point of discerning and judging, the Lord has demonstrated faith, He has illustrated faith, and He has defined faith. He has also given faith, He has increased faith, and He has tested faith. See, there's, there's been enough revealed for Paul and for us to make a, a, an assessment of faith, to see how the brethren are doing. In fact, Paul sent people to, to see how the brethren were doing. And he himself would go to see how the brethren are, are doing. If our idea of faith is skewed, then your assessment of people is going to be skewed. The Lord has demonstrated faith, illustrated faith, and defined faith. Faith has been given, faith has been increased, and faith has been tested. So we, we, we see what the faith is. Now, we, we also have this injunction to examine our own selves, to see whether you be in the faith. I have to see whether I be in the faith. You have to see whether you be in the faith. So you best have a good estimation of what the faith is if you're going to come up with a right judgment of yourself. Amen. The man of God knows faith and therein knows what is lacking in their faith. Now, we can't be rebuking those who are cast down. And we can't be comforting them that are drawing back. He made a right assessment. There was something lacking in their faith. James spoke of faith that was without works. He said it was dead. Now, Paul, James said that because he knew what genuine faith was. So he spoke in this way saying faith without works is dead. He's, he's judging saying there, there aren't any works of faith where I'm looking so there's not faith. That's what James is talking about. John said, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. See, so he was, in adding to the brethren, John was telling them what faith does. If there's no overcoming, then there's no faith. Because that's what faith does. It is the victory that overcomes the world. Peter spoke about the trial of your faith. Faith is tried. Abraham's was tried. David's was, Daniel's was tried. Yours has been tried too. Paul used these phrases regularly, through faith and by faith. Jesus spoke of people having little faith and great faith. See, all of these phrases are, dis, are discerning phrases about how, how God gives faith, why God gives faith, what faith does, how faith speaks, how faith walks. Paul knew. He wasn't guessing. This was not his best guess. I think I need to add something to your faith. Paul knew what they needed, what was lacking, what was deficient, what was needed. And that's what he was going to give. So the man of God has an intelligent, working knowledge of the faith and is thereby equipped to perfect what was lacking in their faith. Now faith is, Hebrews 11.1 1, <clears throat> defines, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Amen. That's what faith is. Yeah. I like to uh, sometimes just insert that, that text, that definition, into other texts that use the word faith. And it's, it's, it's enlightening. For we walk not by sight, but by the substance of things hoped for. Yeah. We walk by the evidence of things not seen. See how it fits? It, it works. You can put that, that definition in there. We're saved by grace, through the substance of things hoped for yeah. and the evidence of things not seen. Amen. See, it works. It fits in there. God has defined faith, that which is lacking in their faith, has to have something to do with things hoped for and things not seen. If there's something lacking in their faith, right. it has to have some lack it has to have something to do with lacking in the substance of things hoped for. Because that's what faith is. It has to have something to do with lacking the evidence of things not seen. Because that's what faith is. Amen. Paul knew what he want to, wanted to say and he said it. He, came, he, was going, he wanted to perfect what was lacking in their faith. They had a deficiency in, in faith. That doesn't... This is not necessarily a rebuke, and I want to be careful in making this distinction because the Thessalonians were new, young believers. So it's, not, it's not that he was, he was uh, turning them from heading in the wrong direction, this is, although that is a liability for everyone who is in the domain of the devil. 
but not necessarily here because they were new believers. He was, adding, he was helping them to grow up, grow up and mature in the faith. Now, in both of these definitions of faith, substance and evidence, the devil has made significant inroads into corrupting and perverting the substance and evidence. Things hoped for has somehow been perverted and twisted and turned into whatever you hope, whatever you dream, and whatever your goals are. The, the evidence of things not seen somehow has been corrupted and perverted and turned into something even that's, that's really just not quite real if it's not seen. See, the devil has made incredible inroads into this. They were somehow, the Thessalonians were somehow, need, they had a need in this area of substance of things hoped for. They had a need in this area of things not seen, the evidence of things not seen. Worldliness militates against the evidence of things not seen. And self, selfish ambition is an enemy of things hoped for. So Paul engaged in perfecting what was lacking in their faith to add to their substance of things hoped for, to add to the, their evidence of things unseen. So when we're ministering to faith, and that has to be one of your prime motives in ministering to the people of God, is, is being helpers of their faith. It has to be. Is if, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so what, what do you aim at? What do you use? What type of material do you have to have? And what do you aim at? You've got to have, what you minister has to have something to do with the substance of things hoped for. And it has to have something to do with the evidence of things not seen. Amen. And that was exactly what Paul was giving to the Thessalonians. Secondly, this ministry, I want to tie this into the, the text, the theme in Ephesians chapter 4, the that which every joint supplies. See, Paul, here he's, he is supplying something. This is a body, a work of the body. It all comes from the head, and it comes through the various members of the body. In this text, it's coming through Paul, and it's going to the Thessalonians. And it's also come down to us. That's how, that's how, far, that's how far this body connection goes, is it's still coming from Paul to us. And so I want to spend some time looking and thinking about <clears throat> this ministry of the body in perfecting, gifting, and ministering. This is how the, how the, body work, the members of the body work together, perfecting, gifting, and ministering. The Holy Spirit said it like this, edifying itself yes. in love. Mm. That's how the, body, how the body works. Just think, just, here's a parallel in nature. And I think the Lord, see, when the Lord created this world and he created our bodies, the, there's, there's so much of salvation like embedded. Amen. Some people have called it like the fingerprint of God, you know, in, in creation. There's so much of salvation and of the nature of God embedded into the, this creation. I like to think of it in this, in this way, that when God created the world, he wasn't just thinking about the world. He was thinking about salvation. Amen. So that's why so much of salvation came, comes out Amen. in the creation. He, because he was creating the world as a stage on which he was going to work out this salvation. Jesus was the lamb slain since the foundation of the world. So when he said, let the waters come together and let the land appear, he was thinking about redemption. So that's why there's so many. So he, on, on, the, on the heels of that, think about how fast your own body goes to, goes to work to heal itself when there's an injury. See, it's the edi edifying itself. Where there's a need, all the members of your body, like, they all rally. That's how the body works. Edifying of itself in love. Now, Jesus authors faith. God increases faith, but we can perfect faith. That's where, see, we're laboring together in, in this heavenly work. Jesus authors it, God increases it, and we are perfecting it. We're laborers together. That's edifying itself in love. The Lord ministers to his people through his people. Amen. That's the rule. He ministers to his people through his people. He sent Nathan to give a very needed word to David, King David. He ministers to his people through his people. He sent Ananias to Saul of Tarsus to deliver that word. Jesus that appeared to you has sent me. He sends his people 
to minister to his people. He sent Paul to the Gentiles. He sent Peter to Cornelius. When Paul, Apollos had passed into Achaia, Achaia, he helped them much which had believed through grace. The people, the people of God ministering to the people of God. This is, the, this is like the mode of the kingdom. It all comes from the head, and then it permeates through the body. Now, the Lord could have uh, just spoken out of heaven to the Ethiopian eunuch. God has spoken out of heaven before, audibly. And he could, God can make himself known. This is not like a challenge. He can come down on Mount Sinai and scare people to death. He can, he can definitely affect people. This is not like a, a major obstacle for God to get people's attention. He can definitely get people's attention. <clears throat> but instead of just speaking out of heaven to the chariot, he sent Philip. And Philip joined himself to the chariot, and through Philip, he, he gained this understanding of who the man was talking about. Was the prophet talking about himself or another man? And so Isaiah 53 was the topic of discussion in the chariot. He was ministering to his people through his people. Every child of God was sent a minister through whom they believed. Yeah. I was, you were. In fact, many of us could, can list off many ministers through whom we have believed and through whom we continue to believe because that's that's the mode of the kingdom he ministers to his people through his people the ephesians 4 our text theme text says that when he ascended up on high he gave gifts unto men and i'm going to say he gave gifts of men unto men that's how he's ministering to his to his people he gives gifts of men Two men. Paul was a gift. Peter was a gift. We're still receiving of these gifts. Timothy certainly was a gift. Paul would send him out. There are times, remember, he, he would have retained him with him. Would have been a, an advantage to Paul to keep him, but he sent him. He sent him as a gift. The Lord sent a gift some generations back, named Martin Luther. We're, we're still, we still see today some of the benefits of that gift that God sent into the world. The Lord sent a gift named Charles Haddon Spurgeon into the world. And the, all these gifts that he's given into the world, their works still follow them. What would it be like if an angel every Sunday appeared in every assembly? To deliver the message. Now they, they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. But their ministry to us is not the same as our ministry to one another. This is, this is how the Lord has, has ordained it. Every, everyone in the kingdom is a servant. So the, servant, the angels serve God and the angels, God sends them to serve us. There's gonna, I think there's going to be like a whole category of, of the world to come, whole, a whole section <laughs> where we can go and, and learn uh, what the angels did for us while we were in this world. Because I think a lot of it is undiscerned while, while we're here. But they, they are ministering spirits. I'm, I'm, just, trying to, I'm just creating a, a, a contrast here to show that the Lord didn't, he hasn't given the ministry of, of preaching and teaching and exhortation to the angels. He's given that to men. He gave gifts to men of men. The gifts themselves are men. Amen. <clears throat> now, if the angel appeared in his angelic form, then, of course, people would just come just for novelty, right? Just to see the angel. But even if the, if the angel appeared as men, as a man, which they, they have in Scripture, and I... I'm convinced that they still do because the scripture says that some have entertained angels unaware. Yeah. So they still do this. But even if the angel appears in uh, the form of a man and somehow in some capacity ministered the word of God to us, it would not be coming from someone who was themselves partaking of the same grace as we. Yeah. It would not be coming from a man of like passions. See, so you see how the ministry would be different. Now, when we, when we listen to 
the brethren minister about mercy. Well, Brother Bob is one that has received mercy. And so, see, that, that ministry coming from him, see, it has, it has a flavor of a partaker because he's a partaker of, of mercy. The, the angels, see, the angels minister what only angels can minister, and the Lord ministers to the body through, uh, through the other members of the body. Appropriate grace always comes through appropriate vessels. The angels do angels ministry, and men do body ministry. That's how it works. So freely we have received, freely give. Paul was giving to the Thessalonians what he himself had, had first received. And that's actually the only thing that you can give, is what you have first received. So we have received much, so we should be giving much to, to uh, assist one another. The Lord gave the multiplied bread to the disciples, and the disciples gave it to the people that sat down, and that's still how the Lord works. The Lord blesses it and gives it to you, and, and then you give it to others, and as, it's, as it continues to be given, it continues to be multiplied, and there's, it, it never does run slack. There's always extra. The Revelation, the book of Revelation, opens with these words. The Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants. You see how the, it's the giving of truth ministers down from God to Jesus, to the angels, to the, to the pastors, to the people, and it, it's still coming down. It's still coming down to us today. Perfect that which is lacking. I'm going to say that perfecting what is lacking is primarily done by teaching and preaching. I know people today like to say, there's a phrase has become popular. I don't know. Well, maybe I do know how things like this happen. But <clears throat> phrases like this, uh, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one. Sounds like it's smart, except it's not. You can't really see a sermon. You can see an example, yes. But how, how are you going to see by what somebody does that Jesus ever lives to make intercession? You don't see that. You hear it. It has to be, it has to be said. Jesus doesn't give anyone flawed faith. That's not what he means by perfect. He means mature and, and grow up. He, Jesus himself said it this way. If you have faith as a mustard seed, which is the smallest of seeds, but grows into a great tree. That's what, that's what he's talking about. Faith is given as a... It, see the, look at the potential that that mustard seed has. Look at the potential that faith has. <clears throat> at least six times in his writings Paul said I would not have you ignorant what was he doing when he said that he was perfecting that which is lacking in their faith he was, in, he was teaching he was proclaiming he was expounding when he said I would not have you ignorant see your conversion our conversion was much greater than what we knew at the time we were converted yes. so in some regards we, we all start out ignorant much, you, you know much more about your new birth now than when it actually took place. Amen. You, knew, you know much more now about your deliverance from sin than when you were first delivered. See, it's because someone come along at some time, some place, and they perfected something that was lacking in your faith. Amen. That's what Paul's doing to, in Thessalonica. More happened in baptism than what we all knew at the time. In fact, all the teaching on baptism was taught to people who were already baptized. The doctrine of baptism was never used as an evangelistic tool in order to convince people to become baptized. It was always taught to people who were baptized, which tells you a lot more happened than what you knew at the time. They were, see, they were perfecting. You, you've been perfect. There's, all, there's been something that was lacking in your faith that some brother or some sister, they perfected it. They added to you. <clears throat> Paul preached again the same gospel in Corinth that he had preached before to Corinth at the beginning. Why? Because they didn't get it all at the beginning. They needed to hear it again. The, the same God. It doesn't mean that he just hit rewind and play and he just said the same things again. He's, it's meaning he's preaching the same gospel. We're brought in by the gospel and we're nourished by the gospel and we're preserved by the gospel 
and we're fed by the gospel, and we're kept by the gospel, and we're saved by the gospel. It's all about the gospel. We never do grow out of the gospel. <clears throat> Peter said that by this word, the gospel is preached unto you, not was. It is preached unto you. And he was speaking to the church. The Philippians heard Paul say, uh, say this. I will say that right is to say the same things to you for me indeed is not grievous and for you it's safe. Amen. So Paul was perfecting what was lacking in uh, Philippi. <clears throat> Paul, Silas, and Barnabas, when they delivered that letter uh, in Acts chapter 15, it says they, they continued in Antioch preaching and teaching the word of the Lord. They continued to, to perfect, to add to their faith and to minister to the brethren there in Antioch. Now, I ask you to think back through your own experience about <clears throat> the, the ministers that the Lord has sent to you to perfect what was lacking in your faith. Doubtless some of them uh, are sitting in this room. Doubtless some of them have passed on and are in the world to come. And doubtless there are, many, there are more that the Lord will send that you and we have not yet met. But the Lord sends members of the body to minister to the body. <clears throat> Brethren have benefited your faith. They've added to your faith. They've given you some advantage for running the race that's set before you. Yeah. This, is, this is one of the deep, compelling reasons that we meet together. And, we, and we, it, it, that it's not grievous to, to be together for, for a long time. You, know? you get the feeling that in some places people just kind of grin and bear it. And they, they really are glad when it's over instead of glad that it started. You know, you know what I'm talking about. None of us would want to be left to ourselves in working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. We are debtors to one another in the faith because all of us have been instrumental in perfecting one another's faith. This is one of the, one of the unique things. There are many, of course. One of the unique things about ministry in the kingdom of God is that someone seasoned in the faith can be benefited by someone brand new. And it, see, the, the, rules, the rules of nature just don't apply to the kingdom. It, the Lord gives, gives to members to perfect what is lacking in your faith. Here's some examples of this. I remember Brother Bob. It's been about 18 years ago. I remember him saying, you're not going to coast to heaven. There is a place that you can coast, but it's not heaven. Yeah. Now, that added something to me. I remember, I can, I can hear him, Brother Bob, say that again and again in my mind, and it's been 18 years since I heard him say that. <clears throat> Brother Mike added to my faith when he ministered that series on You Can Love God More. Amen. Here's something, and this is a quote. I, just wrote, I didn't look these things up. I remember these things. These are in my mind. These are like, like in, they're, they're embedded, ingrained into my, my person. Here's what Brother Mike said in that series. One thing, God is saving you fair and square, and there's nothing that the devil's going to be able to do about it. He said that a long time ago, but it added something to my faith. He perfected something in that ministry that was lacking in my faith. Brother Al has ministered to us. but He said, truth has a value of its own. See, that, ad, that perfected something. In every, in every one of us that heard it and understood it and loved it, Amen. truth has a value of its own. I can just hear Brother Al's voice when he says something like that. You know, that's just, that is Brother Al. Truth has a value of its own. I can just see him. Amen. Brother Leon perfected something in me when he said this, God is most glorified in me when I am most satisfied in him. He's at, he added to our faith. He perfected something that was lacking in, in our faith. Brother Fred has ministered to us all, perfected something that was lacking in us. He said this about the word of, uh, in 1 John. He said, your success in overcoming the world indicates the condition of your faith. Because faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Your success in your warfare with the world is an indication of the condition of your faith. I remember listening 
to Brother Fred, it was a sermon tape. I remember listening to Brother Fred say that when I was 15 years old. And that stayed, that stayed with me to this day because he, he perfected something in me. The Lord used Brother Fred to add that to me. And, and his works do follow him. They're, those things that he said that he added to the brethren, they, they're still adding. They're still, they're still working. Brother Given has just recently uh, perfected something in me. <clears throat> he, he observed the scriptures always say the new man. Not my new man. Never does talk about your new man, my new man, his new man. Always says the new man. Now I think that, that, that revelation is yet to have more implications in my understanding. But see, it's perfected how, how I say things, how I express things. Brother Given perfected something that was lacking in my faith. It's the new man, not just my new man. Now, Apollos was lacking, and Aquila and Priscilla perfected that which was lacking. It would not have been right to rebuke Apollos. Some men's mouths must be stopped, but it wasn't Apollos's. It, it, it was perfected. Something was perfected in him, and then, then he, he went on, and he was the one that helped them much, which had believed through grace. Because uh, Aquila and Priscilla had perfected what was lacking. It would not have been right for Paul to say, I am afraid of you, when he wrote to the Philippians. He did say it where it needed to be said. It would not have been right for Paul to say, I'm comforted by your faith to the Galatians. Because he wasn't. Now what could be lacking? Perfect what is lacking. In your faith. I, I appreciate Brother Mike's uh, observation about Brother Tony's text. It's some gift. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't quite know for sure what it was. But, but he would know yeah. once he was there in, in Rome. So what, is, what could have been perfecting, per, um, what could have been lacking in their faith? It was not technical details. Paul did not have a great burden to, to line out all the technical details. It was not forms and formulas. It was not traditions and procedures. It was along, along the lines of the full assurance of faith. That's what he would add to them, perfect what was lacking. Knowledge and understanding of the gospel. Discernment. Peter spoke about people who cannot see afar off, indicating that they could see something Maybe like men as trees walking. They could, they could see, they could perceive, like in general terms, God's great and I'm a sinner. That's a starting point. But there's, there's, something, there's something lacking. There's more to be seen of God than just God is great. Yeah. He is. Yeah. But he's much more. Yeah. It's been said in our assembly just recently that God is love, but he's not only love. Yeah. He's also righteous. So what could be lacking? All, all the gifts in Ephesians chapter 4 were given that we be no more children. So see, what is, what is lacking? He's not, again, he's not saying that what Jesus gave you is insufficient. It's that we be no more children. Be not children in an understanding, but in, in understanding, be men. Now there's a big difference between immature faith and a person who has been led astray. There's a big difference between someone who, I mean, new in the faith. I should say that more specifically. There's a big difference between someone who is new in the faith and someone who has been led astray. There's a big difference between someone who is new in the faith and someone who is drawn back in the faith. See, so this, this engagement of perfecting what's lacking in your faith, there could be dramatic differences in what's needed. These brethren in Thessalonica were young in the faith. And so Paul addressed them this, the way that he did. Perfect what's lacking in your faith. Now he, he, he addressed other people in uh, other churches in other ways. He said, who hath bewitched you? He didn't say that to Thessalonica. And I I'd venture to say that it's a good thing he didn't say that to Thessalonica. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have been appropriate. It's not, it wasn't right to say that to Thessalonica. 
He asked the Corinthians, he said, shall I come to you with a rod? <laughs> that wasn't needful for the Thessalonians. But it was for the Corinthians. Now we're not going to forbear one another. We're not going to forbear in love if someone insists on Jesus being a created being like an angel. Yeah. We're not going to forbear that in love. Amen. We will forbear someone who's new in the faith and whose their faith needs perfected. We will forbear that. We will not forbear someone's doctrine who eats as doth a canker. We're not going to forbear it. But we will forbear someone who is yet a child and needs to be gently led as young. So discernment, <clears throat> discernment and judgment is needed to be a minister and a perfecter yeah. of faith. Here's some concluding thoughts. I wanted to <clears throat> quickly define perfect. Sister Barb mentioned some of this. Perfect what is lacking in your faith. Does it mean no flaws, no weakness, no need, never tried? No, it doesn't. Perfect, perfect means mature. So it doesn't mean, I think people's, um, people's definition of perfect is probably too small, similar to people's definition of love being too small. The, having a perfected faith is that no man would be moved by these afflictions. That's what he said in the, in the text. In First Corinthians or in uh, First Thessalonians chapter three, I mean, his care and concern for the brethren in Thessalonica that he that drove him to perfect what was lacking in their faith was that no man be moved by these afflictions. Yeah. So a perfected faith means that the the trial comes and goes and doesn't take you with it. Amen. <clears throat> Who is still living by faith that has no need of perfecting? There were some that Paul wrote about that had their faith had been overthrown. Who overthrow the faith of some, saying that the resurrection is past already. Sounds absurd. The resurrection is past already? That's actually very contemporary. There are people today who say that the resurrection is past already. So what is it to, uh, to perfect that which is lacking in your faith? Is that you, your faith won't be overthrown by a message like that. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Paul also spoke about those who, putting away a good conscience concerning the faith, have made shipwreck. Concerning the faith have made shipwreck because they put away a good conscience. Having your... what is lacking in your faith, having it perfected, means that you're not going to make shipwreck of your faith. Now, Paul was not a correction monger. He didn't just really relish the correction process. I think some people do. He corrected because of his care for all the churches. He said, I sent, I sent Timothy to know your faith because of his concern. For the, for, the, for the churches. He went to see, he went back to the churches, to all the churches where he'd preached. He went to visit, went back, same circuit, to visit all of them to see how they do. Because, not because he was a, a correction monger, it because of his care and concern for, for the churches. The Lord said in Jeremiah 23, I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking saith the Lord. Same word, not lacking. Perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So I'll leave you with this word, a few exhortations. I bid you to think highly of the brethren because they will be used to perfect what's lacking in your faith. Amen. I also ask you to think soberly about your faith, about yourself, because you need someone to perfect something that's lacking in your faith. And lastly, I exhort you to expect the Lord to send the brethren to perfect what's lacking in your faith. Because the kingdom only increases, and so we should all become accustomed to increasing. Because there will be no end to the increase of his kingdom and of his government. Thank you.